Okay, so last time we learned about increasing functions and we learned how the first derivative can tell us um, when we're at a local minimum or local maximum. In this lecture, we're going to learn how the second derivative can also tell us information about local minimums, local maximum, extrema in general. So the motivation for today's lecture, I suppose, is basically to determine the graph of the function f is upward or curving downward. So what do I mean by curving upward or curving downward? Well, <clears throat> notice that, for example, I have something that looks like this. This has a, it looks like a bowl, right? So this looks like it's curving up. Whereas if we look at maybe something like this, the graph of that function is curving down. It's like a bowl turned upside down. So in order to um, talk about curving upward and curving downward, we need to come up with a nice way to define what this means. So notice here that <clears throat> if I take a point here, like right there, we have the slope of the tangent line or something like that, right? Okay. Now if I move to the right a little bit, the slope of the tangent line is like that. So the numerical value for the, that slope is less than the numerical value of the slope of this tangent line, right? And if I keep on moving, then the numerical value of this slope is less than the numerical value of the slope of the tangent line here. And then also the same thing holds for here. So notice that the slope of the tangent line at these points as we're moving along, it's getting larger and larger and larger, right? So the derivative is increasing as we're increasing x. Whereas we look at this graph here, the slope of the tangent line here, like that, and if I pick another point like right there, Notice here that as I increase x, the numerical value here for the slope of the tangent line is greater than the numerical value of the slope there. I'll take another point right there. And then that slope is greater than that slope right there. So here, in this picture right here, on the left, it looks like f prime of x is increasing. But here, as we increase x, it looks like f prime of x is decreasing as we increase x. And we learned about increasing and decreasing functions last time. So, um, with respect to the function, 
itself, we know the function is increasing when the, the first derivative is increasing. Um, but now we also know that something about the shape of the graph when we consider um, the second derivative. Well, we'll get there in a moment. So let me just go ahead and define this, this concept. So let f say be a differentiable function. on an open interval i okay. so there's two parts to this definition so the graph of f is said to be concave upward like this on i if f prime is increasing on i. Oh, I, uh, I misspoke a moment ago when I said that the the function itself, the original function, is increasing when the first derivative is greater than zero. And it's decreasing <clears throat> when the first derivative is less than zero. But if the first derivative is always increasing, then we know about the shape. And that's what I meant to say earlier. So I apologize about that. Two. The graph of f is concave downward like this on i if f prime is decreasing on i. Okay, so these definitions here are useful in terms of data science when we're considering optimization problems and we might want to find a minimum. So for example, here it looks like this function is always going to be concave up for all values of x in this picture, or at least on this interval, right? So because it's concave up, we know it's like a pole. So we know that we can find some local minimum. Whereas here, this is concave down, right? If we try to find a minimum on this function, we're gonna shoot way down there, shoot way down there, and possibly go forever unless we constrain ourselves to the endpoints of the interval. So um, we should probably ask ourselves so, a um, question. Maybe let's say, so how can we tell when F prime is increasing or decreasing. And this is where we should reference back to the last lecture. Right? So what did we do last time? Um, I'll just I'll just state it. So last time. F 
F is increasing on an open interval I when F prime is greater than zero, so F prime of X is greater than zero. Well, X in that interval. And then also F is decreasing on I. When F prime of X is less than zero, draw X in that interval. That was from last time. So now we're not considering F, we're considering F prime. And we can think of F prime as a function. So does anyone have any idea about how we can tell when F prime is increasing or decreasing on some interval line? Take the second derivative. Right. Exactly. We just treat it as the same. And I think the textbook refers to this as the second derivative test. But I just, as I did last time, I, I don't like being bogged down with having to memorize all these theorems. I just want to use like first principles about what we know about the derivative to always inform our decision. So we want to know when f prime as a function is increasing, which we can take the derivative of this function. And if that's positive, we know that this thing is going up. If the derivative of this is negative, we know that this function is going down. So how can I state this? So we can say that, again, we're assuming that f is a differentiable function on some, um, some interval i, some open interval i. So f is concave upward on i. So concave upward means f prime is increasing. So we can say when f double prime of x is positive, draw x a i. And then also f is concave downward. So we want to know when that function f prime is decreasing. In other words, when the derivative of that is less than zero. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I should probably make note of some terminology from optimization. So I'm going to say method, but it's kind of an abusive terminology, but just bear with me for now. So when we were using the first derivative to tell, give us information about the function f, we can refer to this as what's known as a first order method. And then here, when we use the second derivative to tell us information about the graph of the function of f, um, we would say that this is a second order method. Can you guess why those have those names? It's about the derivative, right? <clears throat> when we use the first derivative to give us information, first order information, 
second derivative, second order information. Yeah. Okay, so I probably have an example somewhere. So let's say determine the open intervals where f of x equals to x to the power of four minus three x cubed is concave upward or downward. Or and concave downward. Okay, I'm going to pause the video real fast and let you work on this for about five minutes. <clears throat> okay, so let's look at what the solution would be. Okay, so we're going to need to take the derivatives of this. All right, so there's the first derivative. And then double prime of x is equal to over x squared minus 18x. <clears throat> okay, so we basically need to determine when this second derivative is greater than zero or less than zero. It could be always positive, it could be always negative. So let's just analyze this. So um, so prime of x is equal to really, um, what can we factor out of there? Six. X and then two X minus three. Okay, so we just need to know when this thing is positive, when is it negative? Okay. Um, so we should probably find out when it's equal to zero, right? And once we find out when it's equal to zero, we can just test left and right of all those values of x where that function is equal to zero. So finding the zeros of it. So um, the zeros of this are x equals to um, three halves and x equals to Zero. So those are the zeros of that that function. Okay, so now that we have the zeros, let's just kind of break up the real line. There's x. So we have x equals to zero, and then we have x equals to three x. And we set to test left and right of each of these. So let's take that, I gotta know, um, let's try negative one, which is over here. So then double prime negative one is equal to negative six times negative two minus three, and that's positive. 
So the second derivative is going to be positive over here, which means that the first derivative is increasing, which means that um, it should be concave upward on that interval, negative infinity to zero. So next, let's take something in here, maybe three halves, or not three halves, so one half, and f double prime of one half is equal to three times one minus three, which is minus two, which is less than zero. That's right in there. So now let's take something over here, like one. Right? I know, um, like uh, two. So that's prime two. So is that 12 times four minus three? Yeah. So then we're going to have concave upward on the intervals negative infinity to zero and three halves to infinity and concave downward. on this interval here, zero, three times. How do you feel about this problem right here? You good? Okay. Okay. Okay, so let's um, consider some function that might look like this. Okay, that's, that's y, and there's the graph of our function. So it looks like there's some cutoff right here where over here, the first derivative is increasing as we're going up to here. Okay. And then it hits zero. The first derivative hits zero. And then the, the first derivative is going to be decreasing, right? So according to our definition, this function is going to be con so this is like C. This function is going to be concave upward from negative infinity to C and concave downward from C to positive infinity. So observing that these type of things can happen um, motivates us to come up with a way of defining what that is. And this is the definition. So again, we're going to assume that so uh, f be a continuous function on an open interval i. With some c contained in i. Okay. So the way that your textbook defines it, and this is not standard to every textbook, but we're going to assume that there is a tangent line at that point, which means it's differentiable at that point. So um, we're going to say if there is a tangent line, which there would be right here, 
at the point C comma F of C, then this is a point of inflection. If the concavity of the graph of F changes at this point. So this point right here, C comma F of C, that would be a point of inflection because the graph of the function changes from being concave up to concave down at that point. Okay, so we should probably make note of what this means. So in order for a function, a function to be concave up, right, the first derivative has to be increasing on that, on the integral in question. For if the graph of a function to be concave down, the first derivative has to be decreasing, which means that what's happening with the first derivative at a point of inflection, see how the first derivative has to go to, so it's increasing, 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 and then decreasing, right? So the, the first derivative has to change from positive, from increasing to decreasing, which means we're if we're looking if we're thinking about the graph of the first. So I don't know what the exact picture would be of the first derivative of this thing. So it's like so let's just assume that that's like one and like there's um, negative one right there. So at one. So negative one, it's like the slope is like, I don't know, like negative something, right? And then at like 0.5, it's uh, a little less negative. And then right there, it's a little less negative. But then here it finally hits zero at one. And then so negative, negative, zero, and then negative again, right? So it might look something like this. Actually, that's that graph. What does that look like? That looks like this function. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, that looks like um, negative x minus one. If the c is equal to one cubed, so then the first derivative of that is negative three x minus one squared. So it's the negative parabola, so it would look like this, which has a zero at one. 
So yeah, that, that is what the, the graph of the first third of it looks like. So negative, 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 zero, back to negative. So what this is hinting at really is the following theorem. C comma F of C. So if we if we look at this right, increasing, 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 decreasing, right? The, this is the fun, this is the derivative. Increasing, 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 and then decreasing. Right? Which means that that is an extreme, that's a critical number. Of that function, right? So if c comma f of c is a point of inflection, then it's it should be a critical c should be a critical number for the first derivative. Okay. And we know if we have the critical number of a function, then its derivative is either zero or doesn't exist. So since we're considering the first derivative, what are the critical numbers of the first derivative? Or what are the extrema of the first derivative? Where do we go from increasing to decreasing or vice versa? We have the following addition. Then f double prime of c is equal to zero or it doesn't exist. Because the points of inflection are where the, 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 the first derivative changes from increasing to decreasing, which are the extrema of that, right? So just like we did with uh, the last lecture, right? We know, or the lecture before that, extrema occur when the first derivative is zero or doesn't exist. Since we're looking at extrema of the first derivative, then those extrema occur where the derivative of that, which is the second derivative, is equal to zero or does not exist. It's the same, same idea. Okay. Okay. So also from last time, or one of the previous lectures, we learned how to tell if we were at a local extrema, right? We were at a local extrema if the sign of the first derivative changes, right? Um, oh, not the sign. I keep on saying that. We're at a local extrema of a graph, right? Like, like that's a local extrema. So first derivative is decreasing and then it goes to increasing, right? So that that happens to occur at these points of inflection. Or can occur at these points of inflection because, well, that's a local extreme as well. But what, what I'm trying to get at is basically that we can use the second derivative as like another quick way to tell if we're at a local max or min. All right, so. Suppose f prime of c is equal to zero and um, f prime f double prime exists on an open interval containing c.
So recall from earlier that if the first derivative was, I mean, if the second derivative was positive and we're concave up, second derivative negative, concave down, if we're concave up like that, we're at a minimum. If we're concave down, then we're at a maximum. And that's basically what I'm going to say. So f double prime of c greater than zero implies that c comma f of c is a local minimum or a relative minimum. If double prime of C is less than zero, we're at a possibly, it might not look that concave down, but you get the idea. It's less than zero, then we're at a relative maximum. So these are two ways to determine if we're at relative max or min that are different from the techniques we learned last time. However, if this is equal to zero, um, then we don't know whether it's relative max or min, and we have to revert back to the first derivative. In other words, if the first derivative changes from increasing to decreasing, then we know we're at a relative max. If the first derivative is incre increasing to decreasing, um, no, decreasing to increasing, then we're at a relative minimum. Okay. Right, so let's look at like an example problem. So find the relative stream of for f of x equals to negative. 3x to the power of 5 plus 5x cubed. And label them as relative minimum or relative maximum or neither, because they don't necessarily have to be um, both. Okay, so I'm going to pause the video and let you work on that for about. Okay, so let's go ahead and figure this out. All right. So first, we need to find the critical points of this function. And to do that, we need to take the first derivative and find out where that's equal to zero, and then also if it doesn't exist at some point. So um, make sure you guys can hear me. You can. Okay. So, Prime of x is equal to negative 15x to the power of 4 plus 15x squared. So negative 15x squared times x squared minus 1. So then factoring using a difference of squares. All right, so there's the first derivative. And um, we see that this exists everywhere. So 
That's good. So the other critical points are actually easy to see here. So they're critical numbers. So they are going to be x equals zero, x equals to negative one, and then x equals to positive. Okay, so now we just need to determine if these are relative max or relative min. So we need the second derivative to use this theorem, or we could use the first derivative and see where that changes from increasing to decreasing, um, or from negative to positive, actually. So let's just try the second derivative. Then. Oh, so what is that? Negative, so 60x cubed plus 30x. I'm going to factor out a negative 30x. Okay. Did I do that right? 40 plus 20. Okay, yeah, that's the second derivative. So then let's see if we can uh, use this theorem here. So then f double prime of, oh wow. <laughs> um, it looks like We can't use that theorem. This is a bad example for me to pick. Wait, wouldn't it be negative 30x times 2x squared minus 1? Oh, yeah. Yeah, good. I was about to say, that's bad. <laughs> good call. 2x minus 1. <laughs> OK. So, thank you. So, f double prime of negative one. So, negative two minus one, negative, so, so this would be positive, negative, so that would be less than zero. So, that means that. Um, Sorry, you're not. Two uh two x squared, is that right? Yes, six. Ah, good call. So let me just make some more room. Whenever I don't have much room, I start to get jumbled. Let me double check real fast. That times that. Okay, we're good. So, okay, so F double prime, I'm just gonna go one by one of zero, that's definitely equal to zero. Double prime of minus one, so positive, positive, so this is greater than zero. And then F double prime of one, negative, positive, so this would be less than zero. So here, this means that we're concave up, so we're at a relative min. So negative one, f of negative one is a relative. Min. This means we're concave down. So one comma f of one is a relative max. And when the second derivative is zero, we don't know. So in the case that the, the second derivative doesn't give us any information, we need to use the first derivative to determine um, when the first derivative changes from 
positive to negative, right? Or negative to positive. And that'll tell us if we're at a relative minimum or relative maximum. So there is the first derivative. Okay, so. All right, so if we look to the left of zero and we say it's f prime of negative one, so that'll be positive. Well, that'll be zero. Let's try two, negative two. Oh, I bet you I know what's happening with this, the picture here. I bet you it, this is not what it looks like, but this is what's happening. So here's like zero, and we know the first derivative is equal to zero right there, right? But also, if I moved over to negative one, it's also going to be zero, right? So by plugging a negative one to this, that becomes zero. So there, and then, so this is actually uh, neither. Let me make sure about that. Yeah, it is neither. They don't explain why in the textbook, but it's neither because I bet because the graph looks like that. <laughs> On some interval containing zero, everything around zero, some we don't know the width of it, but some interval around there, everything is flat on the curve. So it's neither relative minimum or relative maximum. Okay. So from this section. And I'm actually going to ask you to turn this in. Um, five to eleven odd. And I know the solutions are in the back of the textbook, but I only assign these so you can check yourself. Please try them. <laughs> and. Nineteen through twenty five odd. And thirty three through thirty nine odd. And this will be due uh, by the thirty first. Okay, so I'm going to stop the recording there.